Welcome to the GED Math 2024 test preparation video from ultimateged.com. In this video, we'll be looking at how to easily solve 50 of the most important GED math questions. From experience of helping thousands of test takers to pass the GED with ease, we've noticed that the best way by a far margin to prepare for the GED is to use standard GED test questions. So let's dive right in. Question 1. Which of the following algebraic expressions is represented by the product of 7 and a number increased by 5 is 30? To pass the GED math, you have to know how to translate from word to mathematical expressions. This will help you solve a lot of word problems. We will just solve this and add a link in the description to a complete free lesson and a downloadable sheet on translations of expression. Please check it out. Let's translate it the product of 7 and a number. Here, product implies multiplication. If we let a number be represented by a variable, say x, this part of the phrase translates to 7 times x. 7 times x is the same as 7x. Increased by 5. Increased by implies addition. So we add 5 to it. Is 30. Is in mathematical expressions implies equality. So, is 30 means equals 30. Therefore, the correct answer is A. 7x plus 5 equals 30. Question 2. On a coordinate plane, plot the following four points. A. Negative 4, negative 3. B. Negative 4, 2. C. 5, 2. And D. 5, negative 3. After plotting these points, connect them in the order A to B, B to C, C to D, and D to A, to form a figure. What is the figure formed? To answer this question, you have to know how to plot points on the coordinate plane and also identify shapes. Let's start by plotting our points. We know that on a point notation, the first value is your x value, and the second value is your y value. So for A, negative 4, negative 3, the x value is negative 4, and the y value is negative 3. So this is our point. For b, negative 4, 2. The x value is negative 4, and the y value is 2. So this is our point. For c, 5, 2. The x value is 5, and the y value is 2. So this is our point. And for d, 5, negative 3. The x value is 5, and the y value is negative 3. So this is our point. We are told to connect the points in the order a to b, b to c, c to d, and d to a. After connecting the points, we will notice that opposite sides are parallel and equal, and the angles are at 90 degrees. So this is a rectangle. Before we look at our next question, we want you to know that we have a lot of resources at ultimateged.com to help you pass the GED. We have more free videos. A complete GED math course. This is a step-by-step -step course from the absolute beginning to advanced level. We have a social group. You can talk to people that have taken the GED or are working on taking the GED. Get more at ultimateged.com and pass the GED with ease. Question 3. Find the volume of a cylinder that has a diameter of 12 feet and a height of 15 feet. A lot of the GED geometry questions are just formula work. All the formulas will be given to you on the GED formula sheet so no need to memorize it. It is good to be familiar with them however because they can increase your speed. The formula for finding the volume of a cylinder is pi r squared h where r is the radius and h is the height. To solve this question, we need to know the value of pi which is given to us on the GED formula sheet as 3.14. We need to know the value of height h, which has been given to us as 15. Then finally we need to know the value of the radius r, which has not been given to us. We were given the diameter, but we know that the radius is diameter divided by 2. So we divide 12 by 2 to get 6 as our radius. So we have the volume to be pi, which is 3.14 times 6 squared times 15. We input this into our calculator and get the volume of the cylinder 
to be 1,695.6 feet cute. Sometimes, GED geometry questions are not that straightforward. This same question could have been worded this way. John wants to fill a barrel of diameter 12 feet and height 15 feet with oil. What is the volume of oil he can put into the barrel without spilling it? This is exactly the same question. First, you have to know that a barrel is a cylinder. So you can replace the word barrel with cylinder. Second, you have to know that volume of the cylinder will be the same as the volume of the oil that will be put into it without spilling. Once you know these two things, you'll go through the exact same process to get the volume of the oil as 1,695.6 feet cubed. Find the slope and y-intercept of the line, y equals negative 3x plus 5. Slope questions are now very common on the GED math. Almost everyone gets something on slopes. For this question, you'll use the formula for the slope-intercept form of the equation of a line, which is y equals mx plus b. This will be given on the GED formula sheet so you don't have to memorize it, but being familiar with it can help with your speed. In this form, the slope is the m. This is the coefficient of the x, or simply put, what is with the x? So here, the negative 3, which is the coefficient of the x, is our slope. The y-intercept is the b. This is the constant, or simply put, what is without the x? So here, the 5 will be our y-intercept. Slope is negative 3, y-intercept is 5. Pretty straightforward once you know the formula. We will look at some twist to this question later on in this video. Please encourage us to post more videos by liking, sharing, and subscribing. We really appreciate it. Question 5. A singer borrows $5,000 for two years at 4% per annum simple interest. What is the interest the singer will pay at the end of the term? Simple interest questions are basically formula work and the formula will be given to you on the GED formula sheet. Simple interest equals the principal times the rate times the time. We just substitute our values into the formula and solve. Here, the principal is $5,000. The rate is 4%. We convert it to the decimal form. 4% is 4 divided by 100. This is the same as 0.04. So we multiply this by 0.04. The time is 2 years, so we have times 2. We compute this on the calculator. 5,000 times 0.04 times 2 to get 400. So the interest the singer will pay is $400. Hope you've noticed that we keep mentioning the GED formula sheet. It's something you have to be familiar with before taking the test. You can check ultimateged.com for more on that. Question 6. Find the number of years needed to pay $6,000 with an interest of $360 if the interest rate is 3% per annum. For every formula you are given, you can be asked to find any of the values in that formula. You can be asked to find the rate, principal, interest, or time. Here, we are supposed to find time. We know our principal is $6,000. Our interest is $360 and our rate is 0.03. We divided the 3 by 100 to get the decimal form of 3%. Simple interest equals the principal times the rate times the time as we saw in the previous question. We have 360 equals 6,000 times 0.03 times t. We solve for t. Since the 6,000 times 0.03 are multiplying, we can divide both sides by it. This will cancel out. We can now compute this side with our calculator. 360 divided by 6,000 times 0.03. This will give us t equals 2, meaning the time is 2 years. Question 7. Find the slope of the line. The slope of a line is the change in y over the change in x. The change in y simply means how many points you are going up or down. If you are going up, 
then you have a positive change. If you are going down, then you have a negative change. The change in X simply means how many points you are going to the right or left. If you are going to the right, then you have a positive change. If you are going to the left, then you have a negative change. Take a moment and let this sink in. It is the basis of most of the things we will be doing with slopes and graphs. Let's look at our question. Our first step will be to choose any two points on the line. I am choosing these two points. Let me call them A and B. You can choose any two points on the line. However, it is important to choose points that will make your work easier. Choose points whose X and Y values can be easily determined. Normally, points at the corners are best. Any of these points would have worked well also. Now to find the slope, all we are doing is moving from one point of the line to the other on the slope triangle. Let's move from B to A. We moved down two points. Notice moving down is negative. So we have negative two here. Then we will move to the left one to get to A. Notice that moving to the left is negative. We have negative one here. Negative two over negative one is simply two. So our slope is two. We could have also moved from A to B. Let's look at it. We have our slope triangle here. We move two points up. Moving up is positive, so we have two. Then we will move to the right one. Moving to the right is positive. So we have one. Two over one is the same as two. We notice that we got the same answer. There are other things you can do, but I don't want to get you confused with that. Notice that our first movement is always change in Y, that is moving up or down, then our second movement is change in X, that is moving left or right. Question 8. In order to ship 2,500 gallons of a product to another country, Stan's shipping company had to package the gallons into boxes. If they had 20 package boxes, and 100 gallons left that are not in boxes, how many gallons were in a box? This kind of two-step equation word problem is very common on the GED. We are first going to solve it in details for teaching purpose, then I'll show you how you can solve it in less than 10 seconds on an actual GED test. You have three values in these type of questions. Let's write them down. We have 2,500 gallons. We have 20 boxes. And finally, we have 100 gallons. The 2,500 gallons represents the total. So we have equals 2,500. The 20 boxes is what I call the group. The gallons have been grouped into boxes. For most questions, the group can also be identified as the number that represents something different from the other two numbers. So here, 2,500 represents gallons. The 100 also represent gallons but the 20 represent boxes. So the 20 will be the group. The group is the one with the X. So we will have 20 X. We can now add the 100 gallons left to the equation and solve for the X in this two-step equation. Subtract 100 from both sides. These will cancel out. 2,500 minus 100 will be 2,400. We now have 20 X equals 2,400. Divide both sides by 20. The 20 will cancel out. 2,400 divided by 20 will be 120. This means there were 120 gallons in each box. The hard part of this question is to be able to pull out the values from the word problem. Let's look at how you can speed up solving this question. First, there's absolutely no reason to write this part if you know what you're doing. You can go straight to writing your two-step equations. We have our group 20x, our other plus 100, and our total 2,500. Then you can solve the two-step equation. An even faster method to solve this question in less than 10 seconds is to do 2,500 minus 100 divided by 20 on your calculator to get 120. We did the total minus other divided by the group. A big caution when using fast methods is to note that they are very specific to specific questions and little twists to the question can let you get it wrong. So when in doubt, use the longer methods. 
Question 9. Simplify the algebraic expression 4x squared minus 5x plus 3 minus the quantity 2x squared minus 4x plus 1. Simplifying and expanding are very common on the no calculator section of the GED, so it's important you are familiar with them. To solve this, we will first distribute the negative sign in front of the parentheses. A negative sign in front of parentheses affects all the terms in the parentheses. When we distribute the negative sign, it changes each sign inside the parentheses. The term 2x squared becomes negative 2x squared. Negative 4x becomes positive 4x because a negative times a negative is a positive, and plus 1 becomes minus 1. After distribution, the expression becomes 4x squared minus 5x plus 3 minus 2x squared plus 4x minus 1. Next, we combine like terms. Combine the x squared terms. 4x squared minus 2x squared equals 2x squared. Combine the x terms. Minus 5x plus 4x equals negative 1x, or simply minus x. Combine the constant terms. 3 minus 1 equals 2. So after simplifying, the expression is 2x squared minus x plus 2. Question 10. Find the length of the side marked x. When you see this mark on a triangle, it means it's a right triangle. Right triangles have this angle being 90 degrees. When you have a right triangle, you can use the Pythagoras theorem to find the sides. This formula will be given to you on the GED. Hypotenuse, which is the long side, squared, equals a squared plus b squared, where a and b are the two other sides. Here, the long side or hypotenuse is what we are finding. So we have x squared equals 4 squared plus 3 squared. 4 squared is 16 and 3 squared is 9. We add them. 16 plus 9 is 25. To find x, we will find the square root of both sides. This will cancel out. Square root of 25 is 5. Therefore, x equals 5. Please note that most questions can be converted to word problems. Let's look at a word problem similar to this. Question 11. A pole, which is 4 feet tall, casts a shadow 3 feet on the ground. What is the distance from the top of the pole to the end of the shadow it casts? When it comes to solving geometry word problems, your diagram is one of the most important things. Let's get a diagram. So this is our pole, which is 4 feet. This is the shadow it casts, which is 3 feet. We are supposed to find the distance from the top of the pole to the end of the shadow. Let's call this x. We see that we have formed a right triangle. Now, this question is just like the previous. You can try it out yourself. We can use the Pythagoras theorem to solve it. This formula will be given to you on the GED. The hypotenuse, which is the long side, squared equals a squared plus b squared. Here, the long side or hypotenuse is what we are finding. So we have x squared equals 4 squared plus 3 squared. 4 squared is 16 and 3 squared is 9. We add them. 16 plus 9 is 25. To find x, we will find the square root of both sides. This will cancel out. Square root of 25 is 5. Therefore, x equals 5. So the distance from the top of the pole to the end of the shadow is 5 feet. Question 12. Find the mean, mode, and median of 4, 3, 4, 5, 7, 4, and 8. Finding the mean is the same as finding the average. We will add all the values and divide it by the number of values. There are seven values here. So we will have 4 plus 3 plus 4, plus 5 plus 7 plus 4, plus 8, divided by the number of values, which we know is 7. Adding this, we will have 35 over 7. 35 divided by 7 is 5. Therefore, the mean is 5. The mode is the item with the highest frequency. Here, there are more 4s than any other number, so 4 is the mode. The median is the middle number. 
To find the median, we first have to arrange the numbers. So we have 3, 4, 4, 4, 5, 7, and 8. Here, the median will be 4. It's the number in the middle. Please note that if you have an even number of values, you'll add the two middle numbers and divide it by 2. Please let us know if you have questions on this part. Question 13. In order to graduate, Michael has to make an average score of at least 90. If he made 9 to 5 and 9 to 4 on his first two tests, what should his minimum score be in his final test in order to graduate? This is an average or mean question. To find the average, we need to add all the scores divided by the number of tests taken. We've been given the average he must get, which is 90. So we can put it here. Now we also know the number of tests he is taking. He's taken two, and there's one more left. So he's taken a total of three tests. So we can put it here. We know what goes at the top is the sum of the tests. Two of them have been given. We have 9 to 5 as the first score plus 9 to 4 as the second score. We don't know the third score, so we will represent it by x and solve for x. Please, learn this setup. It's quite common on the GED. Okay, let's solve it. Since the 3 is dividing, we can multiply both sides by 3. This 3 will cancel out. 90 times 3 is 270. Now let's add this. 94 plus 9 to 5 is 189. We have a one-step equation. Since the 189 is adding, we can subtract 189 from both sides. This will cancel out. 270 minus 189 is 81. So Michael must get a minimum score of 81 to graduate. There are other ways we could have solved this, but we chose this method because it helps you solve any average or mean question, no matter the twist. Find the slope of a line that passes through the points 2, 4 and the point 6, 5. To find the slope of a line given two points, we will use the slope formula. m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Formulas are given on the GED, so don't worry too much about it. Please note that you can call any of the point 1 or 2. I'm choosing this as 1 and this as 2. We know that when you have a point, the first value is your x and the second value is your y. Since we are calling this point 1, we will have x1, y1 here. Same thing for this. Since we are calling this our point 2, we can call this x2, y2. We just put the values into the formula. We have 5, which is y2, minus 4, which is y1, divided by 6, which is x2, minus 2, which is x1. We simplify. 5 minus 4 is 1, over 6 minus 2, which is 4. So the slope is 1 over 4. Question 15. The slope of a line is 2. Which of the lines will be parallel to it? A. Y equals 3x plus 2. B. Y equals 2x plus 3. C. Y equals x plus 2. D. Y equals negative 1 over 4x plus 3. Lines with the same slope are parallel. Since the slope of the line is 2, we are basically looking for the answer which also has slope of 2. All the answers are in the slope-intercept form of the equation of a line. That is, y equals mx plus b. We know that in this form the coefficient of the x, or simply put what is with the x is the slope. Choice b has the coefficient of the x to be 2. That means it has the same slope of 2 as the question. Therefore, it's parallel. Let's look at our question 16. Here, we are supposed to solve for x, given this rectangle. We know that perimeter simply means adding all the sides. We know this is a rectangle, so opposite sides have the same size. This place will also be 2x plus 3. This will be 3x plus 7. Now we can add all these parts, and it must be equal to the perimeter 50. We have 3x plus 7, plus 2x plus 3, plus 3x plus 7, 
plus 2x plus 3. This is equal to 50. We can add all the x terms. 3x plus 2x plus 3x plus 2x. This will give us 10x. We can add the numbers. 7 plus 3 plus 7 plus 3. This will give us 20. We have a two-step equation here, which you should be very familiar with how to solve. You can check out our video on equations if you need help. Subtract 20 from both sides. The 20 will cancel out. 50 minus 20 is 30. Now we have 10x equals 30. We can divide both sides by 10. The 10 will cancel out. 30 divided by 10 is 3. So we have x equals 3. Question 17. We want to multiply the polynomials 2x plus 3 and 2x minus 4. We multiply each term in the second parenthesis by the terms in the first. So 2x will multiply 2x to get 4x squared. Then 2x will multiply negative 4 to give us negative 8x. Next, we will multiply by the 3. 3 times 2x is 6x. 3 times negative 4 is negative 12. Please note that the method we used is what is commonly known as the FOIL method. I'm personally not a fan of most acronyms in mass. They bring little benefits and can actually cause you to get questions wrong. Next, we check if there are like terms we can add or subtract. We can add negative 8x and 6x to get negative 2x. So our final answer is 4x squared minus 2x minus 12. Question 18. Find 20% of 300. There are three good methods for solving questions like this. Please watch our other videos to see other ways of solving it and pick the one that's best for you. We will use the proportion method for this method. We will put our is value here. We will put our of value here. We will put our percent value here. Then 100 here. For this question, we have 20%. So we put 20 for our percent value. We have of 300. So the 300 is our of value. We will put it here. We have 100 here, which is constant. Now we have our is value left, so we can represent by x and solve for x. This is a one-step equation. Since the 300 is dividing, we will perform the opposite operation on both sides of the equation. We will multiply both sides by 300. The 300 will cancel out. We simplify this part. 300 divided by 100 is 3. We have 20 times 3 which is 60. Therefore x equals 60. So 60 is 20% of 300. We can see that once you can set it up, it takes a little algebra and basic math to get the answer. The only problem I see is when the question is phrased like, what is 20% of 300? Students get confused if the 20 is an ES value or a percent value. Numbers with percentage symbols are always the percent value, irrespective of where they are placed. So this question is exactly like what we just solved. Let's look at another example. Question 18b. 30% of what number is 15? We are using the same method as the question 18. Please watch our other videos for other methods. For this method, we have our is value here. We have our off value here. We have our percent value here. And then 100 here. Now let's look at our question. We just replaced the values. Let's write our 100 here first. We know it's constant. We can write the 30 here because it's our percent value. We have is 15. So we write 15 as our is value. Finally, we have off, but there's no number with it. We represent it by x and solve for x. Since the x is in the denominator, your first step will be to cross multiply. So we have x times 30. This will give us 30x. Then we have 15 times 100. This is 1,500. Now we have a one-step equation. The 30 is multiplying, so we will divide both sides by 30. The 30 will cancel out. 1,500 divided by 30 is 50. Therefore, x equals 50. 
meaning 30% of 50 is 15. Please, I cannot overstress the importance of knowing how to solve these kind of percentage problems. You have to master it. Graph the inequality x greater than negative 4. Let's bring our number line. When graphing inequalities, the first thing is to locate your point, which will be the number. Here, it is negative 4. Then you'll draw a shaded or unshaded circle at the point. If you have less than or greater than, then the circle will not be shaded. If you have less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, you will use the shaded circle. So basically, if it has an equal to, you will shade. In this case, since it's just greater than, we will not shade the circle. Then finally, we draw an arrow. The easiest way to get this always right without thinking is to make sure your inequality is in the form, variable, inequality sign, and then the number. In that form, the direction of your arrow will be the same as the direction of the inequality sign. Here, since this is in that form, we will draw our arrow facing here and we are done. Graph the inequality, 2 greater or equal to x. Let's bring our number line. We follow our steps. We first locate our point, in this case 2. We decide if it should be shaded circle or not. In this case, it will be shaded because it's greater than or equal to. We set it shaded if there is equal to. Then finally, we find out the direction of our arrow. We set if the inequality is in the form, variable, inequality sign and the number, the direction of your arrow will be the same as the direction of the inequality sign. This is not in the form, so your arrow will face the opposite direction as the inequality. Here, normally, your arrow will face this way, but now it will rather face this way. So we will draw our arrow here. Another way to look at inequalities in this form is to always convert it to the form, variable, inequality sign, and the number. If your brother is older than you, it means that you are younger than your brother. So if 2 is greater or equal to x, then we can say that x is less or equal to 2. You can look at it as just a mirror image. In this form, we can easily notice the direction of the, the arrow. We get exactly the same answer. Question 21. Which line is perpendicular to y equals 2x plus 5? a. y equals 2x minus 1 b. y equals negative 2x plus 5 c. y equals 3 over 4x plus 5 d. y equals negative 1 over 2x plus 1 The slope of a perpendicular line is the negative reciprocal of the slope of the original line. The reciprocal of a number is basically flipping the numerator and denominator. So 3 over 4 will be 4 over 3. Here, we know the slope of the question is 2. Since this is in the slope-intercept form of the equation of a line, please revise question 14 and 15 if you have forgotten the slope-intercept form. 2 is the same as 2 over 1. The reciprocal is 1 over 2. The negative reciprocal of 2 is therefore negative 1 over 2. We are looking for the answer which has a slope of negative 1 over 2. Choice D has the coefficient of the x to be negative 1 over 2. That means choice D has a slope of negative 1 over 2. This is the negative reciprocal of the slope 2 in the question. Therefore, it's perpendicular. The product of two consecutive integers is 30. Find the two numbers. This is a question that you can easily solve without using any mathematical methods. Consecutive integers are simply numbers that follow each other. So 3, 4, 5, 6 are consecutive integers. 25 and 26 are also consecutive integers. I'm sure you get the point. So we are looking for two numbers that multiply to get 30. The two numbers must also follow each other. The two numbers are 5 and 6. 5 times 6 is 30. Pretty straightforward if you know your multiplication table. Question 23. The product of two consecutive integers is 30. If the smaller number is x, write an equation to find the value. This is the same as question 22, just harder. 
The GED is now having more questions in which the answers are not actual values, but an expression, a function, or an equation. This is a typical example. We know that consecutive integers are numbers that follow each other. For consecutive integers, if the smaller number is x, then the next number will be x plus 1. So if x is 2, then the next number will be 2 plus 1, which is equal to 3. Product means multiplication. So we have the smaller number x times the next number x plus 1 to be equal to 30. We can expand this. We have x times x, this will give x squared. Then we have x times 1, which is 1x, or simply x. So the equation is x squared plus x equals 30. Find the area of the figure below. Use pi equals 3.14. The work here is to be able to identify that you can break this into multiple shapes, find the area of each shape, and add the areas. For this figure, we can draw a line here, so that we have a rectangle A and a semicircle B. Area of a rectangle is length times width. This formula is given on the GED formula sheet. We know the length as 12 inches and the width as 5 inches. We multiply it to get 60 inches squared. Next, we have to find the area of the semicircle. The area of a circle is pi r squared. This formula is also provided on the GED. So the area of a semicircle, or half a circle, will be pi r squared over 2. We don't know r. We know that since this is a rectangle, if this side is 5 inches, it means this side will also be 5 inches. This means the diameter of the circle is 5. The radius of a circle is half the diameter, so we divide the 5 by 2 to get 2.5 as the radius. Now we find the area of the semicircle. Pi, which has been given as 3.14, times 2.5 squared over 2. We compute it on the calculator to get 9.8125 inches squared. Finally, we add the area of the two shapes. We have 60 plus 9.8125. This will give us 69.8125 inches squared as the area. To two decimal places will be 69.81 inches squared. Please. Questions here can be in any form. Break them into multiple shapes. Find the measurements you need to find the area of each shape. Then combine the shapes. What function represents the information in the table? A f of x equals 2x plus 1, b, f of x equals x minus 3, c, f of x equals x plus 3, d, f of x equals 3x minus 3. Here, the best way is to solve it from the answers. We input the x values into the various functions and see if we will get our f of x values. For teaching purpose, we are going through everything. You don't have to on the test. You can accurately eyeball and eliminate obvious wrong choices. Since it's easy to work with zero, I'll try that first so I can narrow the possible answers. Replace x with zero for choice A. Two times zero plus one equals one. It was supposed to be negative three, so choice A is definitely wrong. Replace x in choice B with zero. Zero minus three equals negative three, so choice B is a possible answer. Now replace x with 1 in choice b to confirm. 1 minus 3 equals negative 2. It was supposed to be 0, so choice b is wrong. Replace x in choice c with 0. 0 plus 3 equals 3. It was supposed to be negative 3, so choice c is wrong. So since choice a to c are wrong, it means choice d will be the answer. Let's confirm. Let's replace x with 0. We have 3 times 0 minus 3 equals negative 3 as expected. We try 1. We have 3 times 1 minus 3 equals 0 as expected. Then we try 2. We have 3 times 2 minus 3 equals 3 as expected. So D is definitely the answer. A bus can take 12 students for a trip. How many such buses are needed to take 235 students for a school field trip? 
This is a straightforward division question. All you have to do to find the number of buses needed is to divide 235 by 12. You compute this on the calculator to get 19.583. For questions like this, when you get a decimal, you'll always round it up. Because even if you have one student left, you have to use a full bus to take them. So we'll round the 19.583 up to get 20 buses as our answer. This question was pretty straightforward. That's why we simply use division, but the right way to solve questions like this, especially if complexities are introduced, is to use proportion. Setting up proportions is one of the most important word problem skills on the GED. For this, we will have buses is to student. One bus took 12 students. X buses will take 235 students. We solve for X. We first cross multiply. 12 times X is 12X. 1 times 235 is 235. Next we can find the X by dividing both sides by 12. The 12 will cancel out. 235 divided by 12 is 19.583. You'll notice we got the same thing. The rest of the process is exactly the same. We round it up to get 20 buses as our answer. Faith spends three hours hiking six miles. If she hikes at the same rate, how many hours will she spend hiking 15 miles? This is a typical proportion question. Please note that on the GEDs, you can have questions with lots of unnecessary reading. This same question could have been, Faith wants to be the most athletic student in her school. To achieve that, she spends three hours hiking six miles on Mondays. If she decides to hike for 15 miles to maximize her strength, how many hours will she need to achieve that? Assuming she hikes at the same rate. Okay, let's solve it. We have our hours here and miles here. 3 is to 6. Since we know the miles, 15, we'll put it here. Since we don't know the hours or the hours is what the question is asking for, we will represent with x and solve for x. We cross multiply. 6 times x is 6x. Six 3 times 15 is 45. We will now divide both sides by 6. The 6 will cancel out. 45 divided by 6 is 7.5. This is 7.5 hours, which is the same as 7 hours 30 minutes. Which of the following is a point on the line, y equals 2x minus 7? a. 2, 5. b. 3, negative 1. c. 4, negative 3. d. negative 2, 2. We know that for a point, the first value is your x value, and the second value is your y value. If a point lies on this line, then when you input the x value into the equation of the line, you should get the corresponding y value. So we start with option A. We replace the x with 2. We have 2 times 2 minus 7. This is negative 3. It was supposed to be 5. So choice A is wrong. Let's try choice B. We replace the x with 3. We have 2 times 3 minus 7. This will give us negative 1, which is what we expected. So choice B is the answer. The following graph represents the score range of students in a math class. How many students are in the class? Being able to read and interpret graphs is a must on the GED. Here, the x-axis represents the score range and the y-axis represents the number of students whose score are within that range. From the graph, you'll notice that there are three students whose score ranged from 61 to 70. From the graph, there are five students whose score ranged from 71 to 80. From the graph, there are four students whose score ranged from 81 to 90. From the graph, there are two students whose score ranged from 91 to 100. We add these to get the number of students. 3 plus 5 plus 4 plus 2 equals 14. Therefore, there are 14 students in the class. Question 30. The following graph represents the score range of students in a math class. What percentage of students failed the test if the passing score is 71? 
Please, it's very important you master how to find percentages, especially from graphs. From the graph, we can see that three students scored 61 to 70. All the other students scored 71 or above. Percentage of students that failed will be the number of students that failed, which is 3, over the total number of students, which is 14, like we saw in question 29. This will be multiplied by 100 to get the percentage. Compute this on the calculator to get 21.43% failed. With what you just learned, you should be able to answer questions like what percentage of students passed and what percentage of students scored 71 to 80. Question 31. The following graph represents the score range of students in a math class. How many students scored exactly 95? This is a trick question. Most students assume that the answer is two students. Since the 95 is within this range 91 to 100, this is wrong. A range doesn't tell you the exact values within the range. So the two students who scored between 91 and 100 could have scored 92 and 92, or 95 and 98, or 100 and 100. So the answer is, there's not enough data or information to answer the question. Please watch out for a little trick question like this. Pay extra attention to your graphs. Question 32. Convert 96 inches to feet. We are given our conversion factor as 1 foot equals 12 inches. We can use proportions to solve it like what we did in question 26 and 27. Check out ultimateged.com if you're interested in that method. Here, we'll solve it in another way. The best setup looks like this. You'll first write down what you are converting. In this case, 96 inches. Then you'll bring your conversion factor. You want to write it in a fraction form such that the inches will cancel out. You basically want the bottom factor to be the same as the value you're converting so you can cancel. Here, we will write 1 foot over 12 inches. The inches can cancel out. We now have 96 times 1 foot over 12. This will give us 8 feet. So 96 inches is 8 feet. Let's take another example. Question 32b. Convert 6 feet to inches. We are given our conversion factor as 1 foot equals 12 inches. You'll first write down what you are converting. In this case, 6 feet. Then you'll bring your conversion factor. You want to write it in a fraction form such that the feet will cancel out. You basically want the bottom factor to be the same as the value you're converting so you can cancel. Here, we will write 12 inches over 1 foot. The feet can cancel out. We now have 6 times 12 inches over 1. This will give us 72 inches. So 6 feet is 72 inches. Convert 5 yards into inches. Given the conversion factors, 1 foot equals 12 inches and 1 yard equals 3 feet. You can have questions in which you must use multiple conversion factors. Here, in order to convert from yards to inches, we have to convert from yards to feet first, then we will convert from feet to inches. Let's look at it. As usual, we will write down what we are converting. In this case, 5 yards. We multiply this by the converting factor, 3 feet over 1 yard. The yard will cancel out. 5 times 3 is 15. So we have 15 feet. Now we have to convert the 15 feet to inches. We will multiply it by the conversion factor, 12 inches over 1 foot. The feet will cancel out. 15 times 12 is 180. So the 5 yards we started with is 180 inches. You could have done this entire conversion as one step by basically combining the two steps we just did. We will start with the 5 yards. Then we will multiply it by the first conversion factor, 3 feet over 1 yard. The yards will cancel out. Then we will multiply it by the second conversion factor, 12 inches over 1 foot. The feet will cancel out. We can see that we just have inches left. We compute this on our calculator. 5 times 3 times 12. This will give us 180 inches as our answer. Find x in the diagram below. 
The work here is being able to identify that this is angles on a straight line. Angles on a straight line adds up to 180 degrees. Once you know that, you will just add everything and equate it to 180. Then solve the resulting equation. So here, we will add 75 plus x plus 20 plus 25 equals 180. We can add the numbers 75 plus 20 plus 25 to get 120. So we have x plus 120 equals 180. We can subtract 120 from both sides. The 120 will cancel out. 180 minus 120 is 60. So x is 60. Find the measure of the angle below. Here, the first thing you have to identify is that this is a right triangle because of this mark here. This means this angle is 90 degrees. We know that the sum of the interior angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. So we can add 40 plus 90 plus B and this must be equal to 180. 40 plus 90 is 130. We have 130 plus B equals 180. One step equation. Subtract 130 from both sides to get B equals 50 degrees. There's a faster way to solve this, but knowing how to solve it by adding everything and equating it to 180 is so important I don't want to even teach any other way. This will ensure you get the answer correct no matter the twist. What value of x will make the expression undefined? 2x plus 3 over x minus 2. a, x equals 2. b, x equals negative 2. c, x equals 3. d, x equals negative 3. For this expression to be undefined, the denominator must be 0. You cannot have a 0 denominator. So we can say that x minus 2 must be equal to 0. We solve for x. Add 2 to both sides of the equation. The 2 will cancel out. 0 plus 2 is 2. So x equals 2. Therefore, the correct answer is a. Find the angle x below. You can have questions in which you'll need to use other properties of straight lines to get the interior angles of the triangle. The two most common ones are vertical angles and angles on a straight line. We've already done both. In this question, we can find angle B using the idea of vertical angles. We know that vertical angles are equal. So if this angle is 70 degrees, then the opposite angle B will also be 70 degrees. To find angle A, we know that this is a straight angle. Angles on a straight line must be equal to 180 degrees. So if this is 120 degrees, then A will be 60 degrees. 60 plus 120 is 180. Now we add all our interior angles and equate it to 180. We have 70 plus 60 plus X equals 180. I'm sure you can do this by now. We solve it to get X equals 50 degrees. There's another way we could have solved it. Once we knew the angle B is 70. In a triangle, the exterior angle is equal to the sum of the two opposite interior angles. So in this figure, the exterior angle 120 is equal to the sum of the two opposite interior angle. That's x and 70. So we can write 70 plus x must be equal to 120. We solve for x to get x equals 50 degrees. Notice we got the same answer. Question 38. We are factoring the quadratic x squared minus 5x, minus 6. In question 17, we multiplied two binomials to get one trinomial. The idea of factorization is basically reversing the process. Finding out what multiplied to get x squared, minus 5x, minus 6. You will find two numbers that multiply to get the constant. In this case, the negative 6. The two numbers must also add up to get the coefficient of the x, which is negative 5. This takes some trial and error and depends mainly on how good your multiplication is. The two numbers here will be negative 6 and 1. Negative 6 times 1 will be negative 6. Negative 6 plus 1 will be negative 5. After finding these numbers, 
All you'll do is to put them in parentheses with the x and you are done. So we have x minus 6 and x plus 1. This method works only if there's no number in front of the x squared. In math, we say the coefficient of the x squared is 1. Please check out ultimateged.com for other cases of factoring and factorizations. Here we are supposed to find the area of the green shaded portion. Questions like this is also very common. The work here is to find the areas of the two shapes and subtract it. We start by finding the area of the rectangle. This is the length times the width. So we will have 5 times 7, which is 35. Next we find the area of the triangle. We know that it's the base times the height over 2. The base is 3 and the height is 4. We have 3 times 4 divided by 2. This will give us 6. So the area of the shaded portion will be 35 minus 6. This will be 29. We are looking at a similar problem. We want to find the area of the green shaded portion. Again, all we have to do is to find the areas of the two shapes and subtract them. Here we have a circle of radius 5 inscribed in a square. The formula for finding the area of a circle is pi times r squared, where r is the radius. So we have 5 squared times pi. This will give us 25 pi. The value of pi is approximately 3.14. So we have 25 times 3.14, which is 78.5. Now we find the area of the square. The area of a square is the length squared. We have not been given the length, but we can find it. Since this is the radius, if we extend it to touch the other side of the square, we will have the diameter. The length of the diameter will be the same as the length of the square. The diameter is 2 times radius, which is 2 times 5. The diameter is therefore 10, so the length of the square is also 10. Now we find the area. The area will be 10 squared. This will give us 100. Finally, we subtract the two areas to get the area of the shaded portion. We have 100 minus 78.5. The area of the shaded portion is therefore 21.5. Question 41. Calculate 2 exponent negative 3 times 16. Do not use a calculator. This was the first question on our GED Math 2021 video and most students weren't able to solve it because they were not familiar with negative exponents. So let's look at it here. We'll be solving it two different ways. Method 1. This first method just requires that you know that 16 can be written as 2 exponent 4. 2 exponent 4 is 2 times 2, times 2, times 2. This is 16. Once you know that, then you can replace the 16 with 2 exponent 4. Now we have 2 exponent negative 3 times 2 exponent 4. In math, if you have two numbers multiplying and the bases are the same, you can simply add the exponent. They both have the base of 2, so we can simply add the exponents. So here we will have 2 exponent negative 3 plus 4. Negative 3 plus 4 is the same as 4 minus 3, which is 1. So we have 2 exponent 1. Any number exponent 1 is the same number, so 2 exponent 1 is simply 2. This is our answer. Let's look at method 2. Method 2. First, we have to know that we can move a number with an exponent from the numerator to the denominator or denominator to numerator by changing the sign of the exponent. Example, if you have 2 times 7 exponent negative 4 over 3, we can move the 7 exponent negative 4 from the numerator to the denominator. If we do that, we have to change the exponent negative 4 to exponent positive 4. So we have 2 over 3 times 7 exponent positive 4. The 7 exponent negative 4 in the numerator became 7 exponent positive 4 in the denominator. Notice that there's this 2 in the numerator and 3 in the denominator. If you are not given any values in either one or both, you can use one. This is not a necessary step, but can serve as a guide. Let's go to our question. We have 2 exponent negative 3 times 16. Here, we do not have a denominator, so we can use one. 
so we'll have 2 exponent negative 3 times 16 over 1. We know we can move the 2 exponent negative 3 to the denominator to become 2 exponent 3. Notice that the exponent negative 3 became exponent positive 3. 1 times 2 exponent 3 is simply 2 exponent 3. So we have 16 over 2 exponent 3. 2 exponent 3 is 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8. We have 16 divided by 8. This will give us 2 as our final answer. Burke's home store rents lawn mowers for $10 plus $6 per hour. Jake paid $64 to rent the lawn mower. For how many hours did he rent the lawn mower? This is also another very common kind of two-step GED's word problem. Here, all our three values are in dollars. So you have to find the group in a different way. I call it the revolving. So again, we will have our total. Here, the total is $64. This is the total amount of money Jake paid for the lawn mower. The group, which we are calling the revolving, is the value that keeps happening, usually per day, or per hour, or each day, or something like that is with it. So here, we have $6 per hour. So this will be 6. We also know the group has the x. Finally, we have what is left or the fixed value. Here, it is $10. We can write the two-step equation for it. We have 6x plus 10 equals 64. We subtract 10 from both sides. The 10 will cancel out. 64 minus 10 will be 54. So we have 6x equals 54. Next, we will divide both sides by 6. This will cancel out. 54 divided by 6 is 9. Therefore, x equals 9. So Jake rented the lawnmower for 9 hours. Please, you don't have to write all these on the GED test. We are using it for teaching purpose. You can just identify your total, fixed, and revolving values and solve the resulting two-step equation. Also, if you know what you're doing, you could have solved this in less than 10 seconds. Input 64 minus 10 divided by 6 on your calculator to get 9 as the answer. What we did was the total minus the fixed divided by the revolving. We are supposed to calculate this without using a calculator. Let's bring our order of operations. Again, we will perform the operations within the parenthesis first. We notice that there's parenthesis within parenthesis. In this case, we will perform the inner one first. So we have 3 plus 2 to get 5. We now have parenthesis 28 minus 5 times 5, all squared, minus 5. Using the order of operations, we have to perform the operation in parenthesis. We'll notice that the operation in parenthesis also has multiple operations. That's subtraction and multiplication. We will use the order of operation to work that out. We know we have to do multiplication before subtraction. So we have 5 times 5, which is 25. Then we have 28 minus 25, which is 3. Now all these has been simplified to 3. We now have 3 exponent 2 minus 5. From the order of operations, we will do the exponent next. 3 exponent 2 is 9. We have 9 minus 5. Finally, we'll do the subtraction. 9 minus 5 is 4, so we have 4 as our final answer. A car travels at a speed of 60 miles per hour. If it travels at that speed for 5 hours, what will be the distance it has traveled? The formula for finding distance is given on the GED formula sheet. Distance equals rate times time. The rate is the same as the speed. For this question, it is 60 miles per hour. The time is 5 hours. We just put these values in the formula and solve. Distance equals 60 times 5. So the distance traveled will be 300 miles. Please, you should be able to manipulate formulas to get different values in the formula. You should be able to find the rate, given the distance and time. You should also be able to find the time, given the distance and rate. Graph a line with y-intercept, 
negative 3, and x-intercept 6. We know the y-intercept is a point on the y-axis. This value is negative 3. We locate it and plot our point. The x-intercept is 6. We know that the x-intercept is a point on the x-axis. We locate our point 6 on the x-axis and plot the point. Finally, we draw a line through those two points and we are done. In a class of 10 students, 7 are girls and the rest are boys. The average height of the girls is 5 inches and the average height of the boys is 6 inches. What is the average height of all the students in the class? To find the average height of the whole class, we must first find the total heights of the girls and the boys first. For the height of the girls, we multiply the average height of the girls by the total number of girls in the class. That is, 7 times the average height of the girls 5 inches, which gives us 35 inches. Now for the boys, we do same. To get the total number of boys in the class, we have to subtract the number of girls in the class that is 7 from the total number of students 10, which gives us 3. Now 3 times the average height of boys 6 inches gives us 18 inches. Now the average equals the total height over the number of students. That is 35 inches plus 18 inches all over 10, which gives us 53 over 10. That is 5.3 inches. Write 87,344,000 in scientific notation. To have a scientific notation, we want to move the decimal point behind the first non-zero digit. In this case, it will be behind the 8. When you have a whole number or a number without a decimal point, the decimal point is behind. We have our decimal point here. So we will move this point, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 points to the left, to get it behind the 8. This is represented as 10 to the power 7. This is because we moved 7 times to the left. We write our 8.7344 times 10 to the power 7. Notice we left out the zeros in our answer. This is how we write scientific notations. We could have been required to round it up to one decimal place. We learned that earlier. So this will be 8.7 times 10 to the power 7. What is the equation of the line that passes through the point 0, negative 3 and has a slope of negative 2? For questions like this, there are two simple ways of solving it. We can use the slope-intercept form of the equation of the line or the point-slope form of the equation of the line. Since we've been given a point and a slope, it is preferable to use the point-slope form of the equation of the line. The formula for the point-slope form of the equation is given as y minus y1 equals m in parenthesis x minus x1. Please note that this formula will be provided on the GED. From the question, our x1 value is 0 and our y1 value is negative 3. Our slope m is negative 2. Now we substitute the values into our equation and we have y minus negative 3 equals negative 2 into parenthesis x minus 0. y minus negative 3 can also be written as y plus 3. Now we deal with the parenthesis. Negative 2 times x gives us minus 2x, and negative 2 times 0 is still 0, so we leave it. We have y plus 3 equals negative 2x. To make the y stand alone, we subtract 3 from both sides of the equation. The negative 3 cancels out positive 3, giving us y equals negative 2x minus 3. So this is the equation of the line. What is the value of the expression 3x squared plus 3x plus 2y when x equals 4 and y equals 5? In this expression, the value of x is 4. Hence, all the x in the expression are to be replaced with 4. Also, the value of y is given as 5. Hence, anywhere that there is y, we have to replace it with 5. Therefore, we can have 3 times 4 squared plus 3 times 4 plus 2 times 5. By order of operation, we have to perform the exponent first. 4 squared, which is 4 times 4 is 16. Now we have 3 times 16, plus 3 times 4, 
plus 2 times 5. 3 multiplied by 16 is 48, 3 by 4 is 12, and 2 by 5 is 10. We add 48 plus 12 plus 10. This will give us 70 as the value of the expression. The chart below represents the yearly number of enrollment in a business school in New York. How many students enrolled from 2017 to 2021? Line charts are common on the GED math, science, and social studies. This is simply an addition question. We will add the number of students that enrolled from 2017 to 2021. We have 4,000 plus, 8,000 plus, 2,000 plus, 6,000 plus, 9,000. This will give us 29,000 students. We will end this video here. Please watch our other videos for more. Thank you.